Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we'll be delving into more true and terrifying tales. Before we get started, though, if you have a true scary story that you would like to share, go to ravenreadshorror.com forward slash pages forward slash story, and you can submit your story there. You can also check out the shop while you're there. The other shop I have is SpookyLovely.com, which is the apparel and Teespring shop. I'm updating the designs there pretty much all the time, so keep checking it out to see if there's something you might like. As always, links to Patreon and anything you might need, including the other channels and podcasts, are always in the description below. But without further ado, you know what time it is. It's time to get comfortable. Grab a beverage of choice and get ready to take another journey into the night. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room, and before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room, only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress, and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off, and check on him. He was always fine, and I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair, standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd, yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side, next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed, I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, Why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light, something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped, the pets stopped acting weird, and the big bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. 
The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid-twenties, and indigenous. I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and, stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor, and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior, with no incidents but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal, and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. First unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. Never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours. Was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor three feet away in an upright position. 
This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th. Our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror, from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, Hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30-plus people show up throughout the night. One, who has never set foot in our apartment prior, commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th. My mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. In August of 2019, my mom got sick. She had a stroke, has diabetes, and so on. So the first time that my mom got sick, my brother was the one who stayed with her. And the second time she got sick, I stayed with her. Mostly because my brother couldn't be patient enough to take care of her again. My mom was being placed in a room that could fit six patients. There was this one time that I went to the canteen, and I bought like food and stuff like that. When I was in the elevator, a guy came in, so it was just the two of us. After I bought some things from the canteen, I went back using the same elevator, and I accidentally met the same man again, with the same elevator, just the two of us in it. We talked a little bit before the elevator opened. When it did, we heard some people screaming and crying. He asked me, what happened? Why are they screaming and crying like that? I said, I don't know, maybe a patient just passed away. If yes, may they rest in peace. I barely heard him say, thank you, like whispering. I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said goodbye to him, and I walked to my mom's room. After a little bit of conversation, I went back to my mom's room, and the crying and screaming voice was actually from that room. So I was kind of curious about who the person was that had passed, the nurse opened the curtain to prepare to move the body, and I was absolutely frozen. 
The person who had died was the guy that was talking to me in the elevator, and who had asked me what had happened. After that day, I had nightmares for a week, and now I'm always pretty paranoid whenever I go into an elevator. I don't know if this story is interesting to anyone else, but it definitely shook me up. This is a memory that I have about my family going to the hospital in which I was about to be born. I recently started thinking about this memory again for some reason. It's just something that I cannot find a logical explanation for, considering that I'm a hyper-skeptical guy. The memory is seeing my dad and other family members walking their way out of my grandma's house, where we used to live, to see my mom give birth my birth, at the hospital. I can perfectly recall how my dad was dressed that day. For the rest of my family, it's kind of a blurred image. My dad was wearing a black blazer and blue tie with pink diagonal stripes, black jeans, and a lighter blue shirt. I remember even how he was walking while smiling, a pretty detailed and vivid sequence of images. So, as expected, a couple of years ago, I might have been 20 at the time, I'm 28 now, I was going to tell him about this weird memory, but before that, I decided to ask him first about how he was dressed the day of my birth, to make sure he didn't just go along with the memory to fool me. And yes, you guessed it, it was the exact same way that I remember. He said he perfectly remembers since he planned it beforehand what he was going to wear for the day of my birth. I freaked out so hard. I would ask myself how this is even possible. It just doesn't make any sense. So I started trying to figure this all out, and I came up with a theory. I later dismissed it, but my family used to record my cousins and I all the time in childhood with this old camera and then put them on VHS tapes. So I started thinking that maybe an uncle of mine or someone else had recorded that moment of my family on the way to the hospital. So I decided to go over all the tapes that I had, plus it's fun watching them. But no, I didn't find anything even remotely close to that image that I had in my mind. Plus, after re-watching my life series on these tapes, I realized they started recording after I turned one year old. So, yeah, one-year-old me tapes were the oldest tapes made, nothing before that. Another thing that I realized, the way that I remember this scene of my family couldn't be recorded in this weird angle and perspective. It was like I was looking at them, walking, but also being careful to not be seen, kind of hiding a little bit behind a wall. Kind of an odd way to record something, right? So that's my story about this weird yet accurate and vivid memory that I have before I was even born. I'm still trying to make sense out of it. Every time I start thinking about it, I can't stop until I sleep. In 2016, my girlfriend and I decided to go on our first vacation together. We booked a three-night stay at the Belmont Hotel, not its real name, which was a historic hotel in the old part of the city we were in. It was an elegant manor-style home from the 1850s, and parts of the property looked from that period. Massive staircases, a parlor room, and original furniture throughout. Our first day, we did the usual touristy stuff. Exhausted, we settled into our room and crashed for the evening. Our first night, we barely slept. My girlfriend and I were both uncomfortable sleeping in the room, and we felt like somebody was watching us. A few hours later, at about 3 a.m., we were abruptly awoken to a very loud sound coming from above our room. It sounded like somebody was pulling or pushing a large piece of furniture, that stuttering of wood on wood, and the creaking. It was unbearably loud. 
This went on ad nauseum for a while. We were totally awake, thinking that somebody was working upstairs, like a staff member moving furniture or rearranging the room. We were both dumbfounded, sitting upright in our beds waiting for this to end. The second day, more touristy stuff. We didn't really think much about the previous night. The second night, we were zonked out and ready to sleep early. This night was strangely similar. We woke up around the same time to the exact same creaking and stuttering of furniture, or something being moved around above us. It eventually stopped like the day before, and we managed to fall back asleep. The next thing I remember is my girlfriend waking me up abruptly, saying, What are you doing? I awoke, standing in the middle of the room in the dark, unpacking my bag angrily and throwing our clothes into the air. I snapped at her for asking me what I was doing and for interrupting me. I was frustrated and agitated upon waking. Suddenly, I vaguely remembered what I was doing, almost like a dream upon waking when you try to hang on to that dream. I sat on the bed and I explained that I was looking for a key in the room, and I remembered wandering around the room desperately, searching the walls, the floors, the furniture with my hands in the dark. I was getting more disturbed the more I explained this to my girlfriend. The idea that I was alone in this dark hotel room doing this really frightened me, because I had no control. Needless to say, we decided to call it early and head home and end our vacation. We drove the full four-hour drive home that night in pitch darkness and fog. I called the hotel that morning to check out early. Speaking with the front desk, I mentioned the loud noises coming from above our room. She replied, There is no room above yours. It's an attic space, and no staff would have been in there at that time. I mentioned that it sounded like somebody was dragging furniture on hardwood. She said that there was a lot of furniture up there, but that no staff member would have been there. I asked her if the hotel was haunted, and after a moment, she responded reluctantly that she's not sure, but she has heard other similar stories. I believe that I have seen gnomes on more than one account. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never entirely sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I have also never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived in his belated grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a drably dressed little old man about a foot and a half tall run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the absolute crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in, and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I've already been through, when he asked me what happened, I told him that I had just slipped. Another thing I once saw might have been a troll, but I'm unsure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you could enlighten me. I'd been doing a lot of meditating, about three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was a three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf troll type thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I have had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. 
There are other times that I have seen them, as well as one childhood encounter with my belated Noni, and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways, and nothing abnormal has ever been found, other than some white spots from chronic migraine, and those popped up super recently. I have even been evaluated by a neuropsychologist. No one has ever diagnosed me with anything other than seizures related to the head trauma. But, like I said, that happened after I started seeing these things. I'm not really sure what it is I'm seeing. I just thought it was interesting. When I was seven, I woke up in the middle of the night to steal some biscuits from the kitchen. Our kitchen is right beside our conservatory, which has a big open window that allows you to glance out into the garden. While eating, I heard some chatter from outside. Curious, I went to go peer outside the window. I saw three little men in red pointy hats outside in my garden bickering amongst themselves in a strange language I've never heard of before or after. I was so stricken with terror that I didn't speak. I ran to my parents' bedroom to tell them about the intruders. My dad was reluctant to believe me, but he could see that I was obviously shaken up by something and came downstairs to investigate. They must have heard us coming, because by the time we'd gotten to the conservatory, they'd already pegged it and were running through the back gate. My dad got a glimpse of them too, but he only saw their red pointy hats. I've never seen him look so scared before, or in such complete disbelief. I'm still completely baffled by the whole thing. I was really young. I can't remember how young, but I must have been under six. I was at my grandparents, and they have an outside sauna in a building with a workshop next to it. I was with my grandpa, and we were talking about something as we entered the sauna. Then my grandpa goes to the heater to put logs in, or maybe to store them next to it. I can't really remember which. But I was facing the benches as we were talking. The next thing I know, there's a little gnome that peeked its head over and looked straight at me from a hole, where all the water goes onto the floor. It must have been only a second, because I stood still and silent, and then it just went away. I told my grandpa, but I don't know if he took it seriously. I didn't know how to feel. I was fascinated, but a little creeped out by it. Later, my grandpa told me something about gnomes living underground, as it is often in Finnish folklore, which made it even more mysterious to me. I know it wasn't a dream, because it shocked me and I remember it so clearly, and I was wide awake. I didn't know where to tell this story, I just thought it would be interesting to tell. For reference, I live in Sweden. My family is very anti-religious, tends to always look to science and logic, and the house that we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person, and is always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, you need a room that is very clean to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment whenever we make the jars of honey. My dad had put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. 
The labels are on a huge scroll, about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes, before he went outside for about 10 seconds just to grab some air. I could see him this entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time that I was watching, I took out my phone. When he came back in, we proceeded to begin again. But from out of nowhere, he asked me what I'd done with the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk, but it wasn't there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start to look all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was pretty tiny, which is why it was so odd for it to just disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still, nothing. This happened about a year ago, and it still freaks me out. Usually, whenever my family and I experience something paranormal, we blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained and it still leaves a creepy feel. There is seriously nowhere for it to have disappeared to, and that's what still really freaks me out. Even in the highly unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it or heard it. Moral of the story, maybe gnomes still exist in Sweden. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to buy alcohol. As we each threw in suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, which is a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 at night. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then we began to head toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning, right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat, a red coat, and this figure was extremely short. This sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. It looked a little bit like a doorway. I didn't really want to stick around. I played it cool as if nothing had happened and returned to my group. And, of course, I never mentioned it to anyone. But I'm pretty sure I saw a gnome at Stowe Lake. This story is pretty short, and I have no idea why it happened. But it was pretty late at night, and I wanted to go to sleep. Just right about when I put my head on the pillow and closed my eyes, I immediately had a vision of a gnome, a really short one. In this vision, he stood behind the transparent curtain that was in front of me, since the big window is right at the foot of where I lay. I could clearly see most of his features, since the curtain was transparent. He had a huge smile, and he had closed but smiling eyes, bald head, and no beard. His clothes appeared ragged, and to be brown and gray in coloring. Right after I had that vision, which didn't seem like my imagination at all, I sat up and I felt really scared. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping near the window, I just couldn't sleep, even though the gnome wasn't there when I opened my eyes. So I went and slept near my sister. Like I said, I don't really know how to explain it, but it wasn't my imagination. It wasn't like when you have a random thought or image in your head that you can easily dismiss. This was like I was watching something happen through my eyes that were closed. Anyway... I would just like to know if anyone else has experienced anything like this related to gnomes.
There's this book called Fairies, Real Encounters with Little People by Janet Board, and in it she discusses stories, both old and modern, of encounters with fairies and gnomes and things like that. There was this one that was written by a doctor in the late 1700s. He recounted a time when he was just a boy. He and several friends spotted gnomes dancing in a field. They were all holding handkerchiefs between them, like Moorish dancers. He said that when these gnomes spotted them, one of the gnomes chased after them, and even grabbed this doctor as he slipped through a fence. The boy pulled free, and said that the gnome, which he described as having a swarthy face, reached after him, but was unable to grab him a second time. They ran to their parents, who immediately went out looking for these gnomes, but they had disappeared. According to the book, gnomes and other interdimensional beings were fond of kidnapping children, who would then act as servants in their world. Another story was actually printed in the Anchorage Daily News. A snowmobiler had spotted a young boy in a snow-covered field, all alone, and with no footprints anywhere. The boy just seemed to have appeared there. The boy said that he was taken into a local hill, one that local Eskimos had said was haunted. The boy said he found himself in a city and met a girl who had been kidnapped and brought there 40 years earlier. She asked the boy for help. The boy said that the Inserat, something like that, think it was the name the Eskimos gave these beings, had let him go for whatever reason. I find these stories really interesting. And I'm just curious if anyone else has experiences like these. I was laying down for a nap. I had my two cats snuggled up with me, and my two dogs were outside. All of a sudden, I heard toenails on the hardwood floor, and then sniffing beside the bed. My brain went, okay, one of the dogs is in here. And then I came instantly all the way awake, because my brain went, wait, how did they get in the house? I sat up expecting to see one of the pups sitting beside my bed, but there was nothing. I checked all the rooms. No dogs. The doors were all shut. I looked outside and both dogs were still out there. I have no explanation other than perhaps I was dreaming while I was semi-conscious. Or I had a visit from a church grim or black dog. I specifically say church grim because my house is unique. It was originally built attached to a church in the 70s for the pastor's family. My great-grandma bought the house in the 90s from the kids of the original pastor. She attended the church and was extremely devout, so when the pastor passed away, she would go into the church from her house every Sunday and turn the heat on and prepare for service. She lived here until she died. Shortly before she died, the church had a new church built, so the old one became abandoned. My grandma inherited the house, and my husband and I bought it from her. So I'm living in my great-grandma's old house that's attached to an old abandoned church. The church still owns the original building, so I don't have access unless I ask. But this is why I think that perhaps I got a visit from a church grim. To start off, I haven't gotten much sleep over the past few months. My insomnia has gotten really bad, and my doctors act as if I'm medication-seeking whenever I ask for help. Anyway, the house that I'm in currently, I know for a fact, has some kind of beings living in this big hedge in the backyard. They've been seen all around the house, though. I saw one on a snowy day run from behind my neighbor's parked RV to behind one of those weird trees that looks like a bunch of skinny trees just growing from the same spot. I'm not sure the name of the specific type of tree, 
but the main point is that you can see through to the other side pretty easily between the little trunks. Anyway, I saw what appeared to be a fat little man, about a foot tall, run from the RV to behind the tree. So, without breaking eye contact with the tree, in case whatever it was ran, I walked over to see if I could find footprints or something, in case maybe it was a rabbit. I got to it, and of course, there were no footprints, nothing in the tree, not even a rabbit or a squirrel. I knew what it was, but I just decided to leave it be, and went back inside. A few months later, my little brother saw the same-looking thing run in between two of the same types of trees that I mentioned earlier, just on the other side of my house. All he said was it looked like a tiny, roundish man, running, definitely on two legs, and again, no footprints. It was muddy that day, so if it had been an animal, there should have been footprints. It seems to me like they use those specific trees as some kind of portal or entryway to something. So that's the first being that I had questions about. The second has been happening a lot more recently, and is why I mentioned at first that I have insomnia, because that very well could be what the cause of this was. Our minds are fragile things when not being cared for properly, after all. Within the last month or so, I have seen this thing in my living room. I sleep in my living room because I have too much anxiety to sleep in the back end of my house. I have babies, and if something were to happen, I feel like I wouldn't hear it. Both times I've seen this figure, I've been laying in bed trying to sleep. I'll roll over and look at my brick fireplace, and I'll see this tiny little humanoid type thing run for just a split second. But it's not fast. It seems like it's a slow-motion echo of a child running. I'm not very good at describing these things, but I will try. It was transparent, but I could make out what seemed like bones. It honestly looked like an x-ray or an ultrasound of a child. It was like a sheer white color, like a ghostly skeleton in a way. It had a disproportionately large head and a tiny body. It couldn't have been more than ten inches tall. As I mentioned before, it looked like I had just seen a slow-motion flash of this thing running. It just kind of dissipated after I saw it. I've seen this thing twice in almost the same spot. The spots are maybe five to ten inches away from each other. I saw it the first time almost a month ago, and then last night as well. I was hesitant to tell this story because I had recently heard from people that talking about seeing dwarves or elves or fae will just piss them off. I don't really know. I just wanted to share the experience and ask if anybody has any idea about what this could be. I'm still thinking fae, but not sure. It doesn't feel bad. It seems more playful or curious. But I know things like this can easily deceive. Any input is appreciated. So, let me know if you have any ideas. This happened just a couple of years ago. I went to Ireland to study for a couple of weeks. There, I met this large group of people from my same country. I didn't know anyone. One boy caught my attention among all of them. In the exact same moment I saw him, I thought, I've already seen him. He just seemed so familiar. I approached him and we started talking. I didn't mention to him that he looked familiar. I found out that he lives really far from my city, in a region I have never visited, and that he has never visited my region either. I also found out he arrived in Ireland after me, so there was no way for me to see him at the airport or anything like that. Then, after some time chatting, he said, Have we already met? I was thinking you look really familiar. That really freaked me out. We never figured out how it was possible to feel like we had met each other before, because we certainly never had. 
and to this day, it just feels like such a glitch-in-the-matrix kind of experience. I don't really know how to explain it. Reading some posts about glitch-in-the-matrix experiences reminded me of an experience my mom had about ten years ago. I asked her about it again tonight, and she retold it to me to make sure I had all the right details, so I'm telling the story on her behalf. My mom was driving into the city one day and was stuck in traffic. We live in Ireland. She was looking out the window at the buildings and saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair in the doorway of one of the buildings. She described this woman as a shawley, which apparently was the name of the women in this part of the city in the 1940s and 50s who worked in the marketplace. They were called shawleys because of the black shawls they wore. She remembers the woman looking out onto the road with a solemn expression, and my mom was particularly fascinated by her because it had been so many years since she had seen one of these women. The traffic moved on and she parked in a car park around the corner from the street. About an hour later, she was leaving the city and looked over to the side of the street as she was passing to see if the woman was still there. All of the buildings were run down and boarded up, including the doorway the woman had been standing in. She said that the buildings looked entirely different to how she had seen them just an hour before. My mom has always thought of this as sort of a seeing-through-the-veil type of thing, but could it be a glitch in the matrix after all? Back in May of 2012, my family and I went to Ireland. We were staying in a cottage in a rural area that was far away from any major city or town. Two days before we were leaving, my cousin and I and her two-year-old daughter, Maisie, were outside in the garden. Maisie had one of those interactive books for young kids that play nursery rhymes, Row Your Boat, Hickory Dickory, things like that, whenever you pressed a certain button. She was messing around, pressing multiple buttons, when she pressed a green one that was supposed to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it didn't. Instead, the book played a song that neither I nor her mother recognized. Even weirder, however, was the fact that Maisie began to sing one line toward the end of the song, which I remember being something like, I will reach the Golden City to join the Angel Band. Her mother, of course, was shocked, as she was only two years old and was just beginning to talk. These words were extremely advanced for her vocabulary, even if she had only learned from memory. When I got home, I searched the lyrics Maisie had sung, and it turned out to be what I had speculated, a hymn, specifically one called The Pilgrim's Journey. None of our family was religious, and neither of us understood where Maisie had learned the hymn, and even less why the book had played it in the first place. We tried pressing the green button again and again, but it never played the hymn again. Just Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, as it was supposed to. In 2004, I went to Ireland on the super cheap during this one magical week where there were insanely low fares. That's not the glitch, I'm just nostalgic for that time. While visiting family there, I picked up a Ross O'Carroll Kelly book, not realizing that it was a popular series, and read The Orange Mocha Frappuccino Years in about a day. The first-person narrator uses a Brett Easton Ellis-like voice, where everything is his impressions in real time. I found it hilarious. At one point, we were walking down Grafton Street in Dublin. We walked past a busker, and he was playing Don't Look Back in Anger, and he was right on the So Sally Can Wait etc. part as we walked by. Something about how he was singing his heart out, even though it's sort of a cheesy song, impressed me, and I turned to my partner and said, You know, 
I don't care what anyone else says. I love this song. And she said, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I heard another one doing it earlier. I had been with her, but I hadn't noticed. Later, in a train station newsagents, we were selecting supper. It was either a triangle sandwich each or a candy bar each. And another book in the Ross O'Carroll Kelly series, The Teenage Dirtbag Years, to read on the next train. We chose candy and the book. She'd read two pages, then I'd read two, passing it back and forth, perfect for a late evening train where half the people were sleeping and the rest were quiet. She handed me the book with an odd expression at one point, and I looked down to read. It said, So I'm walking down Grafton Street with Sorsha, and we walk past this busker, and he's doing Don't Look Back in Anger, giving it all, so Sally can wait. And I turn to Sorsha, and I say, I don't care what anyone says. That's a great song. And she says, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. My own skepticism says, okay, common street, common buskers. And if you Google the title of the song and busker and Grafton, there's a YouTube video of a guy playing that song in 2014. So it is a cliche. And our conversation wasn't at all original, filled with phrases that are really just filler in a way but it still felt really eerie. And honestly, it kind of still does. This occurred about three years ago. I had a position as a buyer and as such, would receive tons of cold calls and emails from people trying to get our company to try their products for resale. Also important, our company had a digital phone system, like VoIP. There was one central number, and it followed a phone tree to multiple offices via internet connection. Voicemails were available on our big office phones, but the recording would also be sent to our emails. So one day, I received a voicemail from a phone number I recognized as someone who had been attempting to get a hold of me, to sell me their products. Oddly, the voicemail was something like 15 minutes long. Curious, I began to listen to it. The message begins with just static, and the sound of rustling. Seems like a classic butt dial, or maybe they forgot to hang up when the voicemail clicked on. I fast-forwarded the message, just to see if anything was ever heard. And yes, suddenly a clear voice. They're having a one-sided conversation. I think, ooh, these can be fun sometimes. Except the one-sided conversation is clearly with me. The person on the phone is referencing my then-recent maternity leave, our company by name, a few other pretty identifying details that currently escape me. They'd stop speaking, and it would be blank air and then they would answer a pertinent question that I would have asked in that kind of a conversation, clearly speaking to me, but I never spoke to this company or this person. I did receive additional emails from them later that were clearly initial attempts at communication and not a follow-up conversation. I checked with coworkers in case somehow, somewhere, their conversation got picked up in my voicemail, and nope, coworkers and husband were equally confused. But with zero explanation, we all just had to move on. I was about 15 years old when this happened. It happened in school, which was in Ireland. In my school, we had compulsory subjects that we had to take, such as math, English, etc. We were able to pick two option subjects. I chose technology, kind of like woodworking but with circuits as well, and art. My best friend of like 12 years and I got put into the same technology class. Now, to be honest, all we ever did in that class was mess around. We never completed our projects and instead we would just burn stuff and do stupid things. Anyway, each table was square, and one person was sat at each edge, and beside each person, connected to the desk, 
was a mechanical vise. It's basically something that you could tighten to hold something in place. My friend and I would literally put anything in there and just squish the crap out of it. One day, we had a piece of copper wire. It was quite thick. I'd like to say a centimeter in width, and it was probably like eight or nine centimeters long. We placed it in the vise and started twisting the knob and tightening it on the wire. When the vise fully closed, we opened it to see what would have happened to the wire. However, when we opened it, it was gone. And I mean like fully vanished. We started to look under the table, in the vise, around other tables, even behind our teacher's desk. After looking everywhere, we thought maybe we dropped it and somebody picked it up. We had like eight others in our class, so we just asked them if they had picked up a copper wire. And of course they replied, No, didn't you just squish it? Or, No, I didn't see anything. Now, I want to emphasize that my friend and I spent at least an hour looking for this wire, and we tested another wire in the vise to see if that would vanish, but instead it just fell on the floor when the vise was opened. We just laughed it off and said that it's probably some kind of interdimensional thing. But we've really been puzzled about what happened ever since. On May 3rd, 2017, my life was pretty similar to how it is now. I'm a bartender in a smallish beach town in Florida, so I know most people who frequent the bars in our downtown area, either as other service industry workers or patrons. I also have always lived within walking distance to work and the strip of bars and restaurants. That being said, I was 23 at the time and constantly hung out with a pretty large group of friends and co-workers and going out almost daily after work. Although this absolutely made no sense from the beginning, I thought for a while that there might be an explanation to what I experienced. If there is, I never got one. And I'm 100% sure that I do not know the person who this mystery item belonged to, but let me back up. I was going through my trunk before a camping trip one day with a guy I was dating, who lived in the apartments across the street from mine. As we're clearing things out, we find a large black duffel bag stuffed in the very back of the trunk. Upon opening it, I discovered it was full of various soccer gear. Cleats, socks, safety pads, and a jersey with a name I didn't recognize on it. I had zero recollection of anyone putting anything in my trunk. I don't have any friends who play soccer, and I never have. The name on the jersey is one that I've literally never heard of, even now and searching on social media didn't yield any results. The guy who I was dating at the time thought that I was lying and thought that it was from another guy I was hanging out with or had hung out with and dated in the past. He didn't believe me that I had no idea how it got there, who the person whose name was on the jersey was, and didn't hang out with anyone who played soccer. That drove me even more insane because I literally didn't even discover the bag in the trunk on my own previously. This was the first time I had ever seen it. I asked every person that I was around regularly as well, as well as pretty much anyone I'd seen in the past month. No one had any clue what I was talking about or recognized the name on the jersey. Please note that there are no spare keys for my car, and I never let anyone drive my car. I always keep it obsessively locked, and my car has never been broken into. I ended up throwing the bag away a couple of years afterwards. I kept it in my trunk forever, hoping that the mystery would solve itself eventually, but no. This will forever drive me nuts. To this day, I have no idea who that person is or how that stuff got into my trunk. I was around 24 years old at the time of this event. I have always had trouble sleeping, and I would sleep during the day most of the time. This particular day, I woke up way later than usual, and once I did, I was really confused because it was already dark outside. 
I started wondering what had happened to my mother, because she never takes her keys with her. I'm the one who opens the door for her when she gets back from work at the end of the day, so I wondered why she wasn't home yet. I was about to grab my phone and call her when I realized some of the lights from our hallway were on. For a second, I thought I was dealing with an intruder or something, but I heard my mom's voice right away. How did she get inside? How come I never heard the door? I got up to make sure it was really her, and it was. When I asked her how she had gotten inside, she got really mad at me, asking if I was crazy, and told me that I was the one who had opened the door for her. I asked her how the workday was and went straight back to my room after. I never opened that door. I was sleeping. So who the hell opened it for her? The door was locked from the inside. Yes, I've already considered sleepwalking, but I've never had it, and no one has ever seen me doing it, and I think my mom would have noticed if I was sleepwalking as opposed to just opening the door as usual. To this day, I know that somebody, who apparently looked like me, opened that door, but I never did. In this story, user Mischievous Dagger tells about the haunted house they lived in when they were growing up. Growing up, I always had to move from one place to another. There was this apartment in particular that terrified me. I was about seven or eight when weird stuff started happening. Basically, things would go missing, things got moved, I would hear footsteps in the hallways. Once, my dad heard somebody or something small running. He thought it was my sister and called her, but nobody answered. When he came to check on me and my sister, he found us both fast asleep. We always shared a room. One time, my mom baked a cake at night. I don't know why she decided to bake it at night, but she did. At night, we heard muffled chewing sounds. It wasn't my parents, as they had gone to sleep hours before that. Their room was in front of mine, and I would have seen them coming out. The next day, we found half of the cake gone. Another time, my dad bought a GPS. He was very happy with it and put it on the table. The next day, it was gone. My sister and I didn't touch it because my dad was very strict, and we used to be scared of what would happen if we touched his things. My mom was home all day, but she's a busy woman and couldn't have cared less about a GPS. It was gone for a week. Then one day, my dad called my mom asking her where she'd found it. It was right where he had left it, and my mom had never touched it. This freaks me out the most, though. I had a saint. A paper with a saint on it. We call it a saint here. No matter how many times I got rid of the saint, it always came back. I ripped it apart so many times, I shredded it, but it always returned whole to my desk. I no longer live in that house, but every time I walk by it, I get this feeling of dread. This past Halloween, my fiancé and I went to explore a real haunted building. I honestly wasn't expecting to have any weird experiences, and I went in being skeptical. We booked ahead of time, and I think it was a group of about 20 people or so that we didn't know. They gave us the history of the place and the rules, and said to go look around. It wasn't a guided tour at all, it was just kind of a do-your-own-thing. The place was super creepy, and I felt like I got weird vibes because of that. However, we went to the second floor, and I was walking past this tiny room that they probably used to store medication. I went to walk into the room, and the mirror in there was broken. I got really lightheaded, and an instant headache when I looked at it. I felt almost like I wasn't myself for about 30 seconds and I walked into another room. As soon as I left, the feelings went away. 
About five minutes later, my fiance said that she had the same thing happen to her before I even told her what happened to me. We ended up standing in a hallway and I was just recording with my phone. I'd say maybe 15 minutes went by with nothing. And then I felt this electricity from my feet course through my body to my hands. And it was like an unseen force went to push my phone away. I wish I could have captured an EVP or some video, but I didn't. Has anyone else checked out a haunted place like this and have any experiences? It's definitely one that's going to be on the books for me for a long time. In this tale, Reddit user expert maybe 5106 tells an eclectic mix of tales that happened at their haunted house. Here are the stories. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I have so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this story to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the most significant things to take place here over the years. To preface this, I'd like to say that I'm a 21-year-old female, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both of my parents, four cats, and a dog. Now it's just myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she'd passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they are attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell and a calming feel that comes along with her. We also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist type activity. That being said, on to some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks me about it. So, one day I was probably around 14. I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in but I also didn't want to just send a black screen. So I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started to struggle to focus. It wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, of course, but I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worst. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest or something come over. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to Wicca. It seemed like BS to me at first, but 
This man had told me that there are ways that we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but as I understood it, a candle alone equals good, and a candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into that, it can open a portal to darker dimensions. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking that it was BS. But then I remembered. Just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom, I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle darn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and get rid of it or remove it, whatever I had to do. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take this Wicca stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little bit less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say that I was possessed for a few hours, but for me, it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me that I did things that I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house, the same room that I got scratched in. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later. So what I'm telling you from here until I snapped out of it was told to me by witnesses. My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights began to flicker in the bathroom, and I just stopped talking, and it was like I was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked me what was wrong, and I responded with, I can't leave. There's someone blocking the door. Right away she knew something wasn't right, and told me to just go out, but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her that she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere. Upstairs, main floor, basement, every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, she saw me standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked me where I'd come from and that she'd been looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily that it wasn't even like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom and she said, no, you weren't. I just looked in there. Once she said that, she said that I completely changed and she could tell that it like enraged me or something. I told her that she needed to leave and apparently I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14-year-old girl talking to one of her best friends, that definitely wasn't like me. She tried to argue over leaving, but apparently the more she did, the more aggressive I got about telling her to get out. So out of fear, she left, and she and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed, and no one knows what I was up to. But... I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered, you know, the portal mirror, with the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared or stop running or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe it is this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except that I didn't remember falling asleep or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we did a little bit more research and we talked with the Wiccan priest. I ended up finding out that I had an attachment, 
that I created, like I said, with that Ouija board at 11, and then I just strengthened it with the mirror portal. I was blessed, and so was the house, and for a long time, things were better. My house, though, is still extremely haunted, and I could share a lot more about it. Little things here and there, like hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs, my dog not being willing to go in the basement, hearing voices being touched, objects moving, stuff like that. But this story is about the craziest stuff that's happened to me. This story comes to us from Reddit user Pineapple Juice. I believe I've told a story from them before, but here are some more tales from their haunted house. I was about nine when this happened. My mom, my sister, and I moved into this old house that was built before the Second World War. My great uncle, who was a veteran, told us stories about when it was in its glory days. Everybody in our town said the place was haunted. And that just put signals off in my head, especially when I remember driving past the front of the house and seeing a girl in the attic window. I eventually shrugged it off, but I still hated the house. I always felt like I was being watched, and I never felt alone. I was always uncomfortable, and I just hated it. I begged my mom not to move us in, but yeah... That didn't happen. Whether you believe in mediums or not, both of my grandmothers had a hardcore belief that we had medium blood or something like that, but that it skipped a generation. My room was the worst to be in, always freezing, always felt heavy, and always had something weird going on. My sister always hated going past my room to go to the restroom, and I always hated being in my room. When we first moved in, I would knock on the floor and something would knock back. I would grab midnight snacks and see shadow men and women and children out of the corner of my eye. One time, I was even making a sandwich and I saw a shadow man in the hall. I remember that I said hi and then continued making my sandwich. For some reason, I turned and the shadow man was maybe a foot away from me. It took me a moment, but then I ran to my room. Another time, I was sleeping in the living room. I felt a hand press against my back and heard light footsteps. It felt like a man's hand. My parents are divorced and no one had their boyfriend over. Another time, I had a few pieces of paper on the table in the living room. I made a joke that the ghost should move it. A moment passed. And then, the paper shot across the table and just stopped, right on the edge. I jumped up and ran. Another time, I woke up in my room and saw a girl in my doorway. And not like skin tone and hair color. She was translucent and gray with gouged out eyes and what I assume was blood going down her face. She had a dress on and a coat. I stayed frozen before I finally jumped up and moved past her. My sister shrugged it off until her boyfriend stayed in my room while I was over at my grandparents' house. He saw the same exact thing, but he shrugged it off until he heard about my story. What made it so much weirder is that what he described is the same girl from the window and the girl that was in my room. There are lots of little stories about this house, but hopefully you enjoyed those. Most people would be thrilled to move out of a haunted house. But for Reddit user Kate the Girl Who Dreams, moving out of her haunted house was different. Here's her story. So my boyfriend and I had been living in this house for a few years. He had gone overseas for a little while and then returned. A few months later, and we started to pack our bags for the move into a new place. 
When we finished packing up the boxes and clothes, my boyfriend did something I didn't expect him to do. He put his hands together and thanked the ghosts for helping us, and then said his goodbyes before leaving the room. He said he felt sad, and it would have been a lie if I had said I didn't feel the same way. For years, activity in that house had rather frightened him. It upset him as well, and a few times it was so bad that he cursed at them within the room as activity occurred, which is why his last action in that room surprised me. I felt that they had been heavily misunderstood, the spirits or whatever. Throughout the years, they had told me a lot about themselves. I had gathered a lot of EVPs and photos from the house. It was a love-hate relationship with them. At times, they would warn me of somebody around me. I don't really know if it was because I was the only tenant who was constantly there and who actually spoke to and got anything on them. One time I was at work and a customer said that he saw something like a little boy next to me. I started to recall the little boy entity who was in the house I lived in. I did a spirit box session later and I asked if one of them had followed me to work. The little boy's voice actually responded and said, Yes, only me. I get that it was scary for some, but moving away from the haunted house was also something that felt rather saddening and freeing at the same time. It's nice in the new place. The first day and nothing paranormal had happened. A rather quiet night of sleep. It feels nice, and yet strange at the same time. Oddly lonely, but... It's something my boyfriend and I will get used to. The only thing is, my boyfriend brought a piece of jewelry that one of the entities really liked with us, so we'll see how that turns out. But for now, it's quiet and peaceful, bittersweet, but still a nice change from everything that was going on before. Time for newer and better things, a change of scenery. This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that somebody had left the oven on. Each of us denied having done it, but we knew somebody had to have left it on. Looking back though, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody had even put food in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, movements from the side of her eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting, but myself and one other were not totally convinced. It was soon after that it was only me left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing some studies, they looked up to see a face peering at them before it vanished. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore that she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would just send shivers down our spines any time we were in there. There was one night in particular that really scared me, though. I always locked my door before going to bed, 
and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself that it was just a dream, and I went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open. So were all of the doors in my wardrobe, and the guys had told me that it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other, all night long. I hadn't moved anything. So many other things happened in that house, but this story has gone on long enough. I decided to tell my story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate, and without saying which house I lived in, he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate that a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior because of the activity. When I told him which number it was, he almost fell off his chair. It was the same house. Over a week ago, my friend and I were out on the town. Later that night, we drove up to the forest, about a mile up the hill and away from my house. It was about 9 p.m. when we arrived up there. It was a very strange night, to be honest. The moon was visible behind the clouds, and everything was very dark. We pretty much were just standing around for about 10 minutes next to my car, in the darkness, looking into the forest and having a smoke break. Then, the forest got super quiet. After that, a guy with a dog came by, but nothing unusual, right? Well, then it got even quieter. That's when I spotted some strange lights in the forest. Probably half a mile inside, between the trees. It almost looked like candlelight. We didn't have any snow by then. It had been about a week or two since we'd had any, so it wasn't that. I told my friend and pointed over to the lights. They just shrugged it off and told me that it was clear. It was probably a house in the distance. But it wasn't, because I knew for a fact that there was no house there. There was only one farther up the road, not over there in that area of the forest. I knew that forest well. We were looking at and watching it for a bit, until this really strange feeling hit us as though we were being watched. We heard some leaves rattling and some branches cracking. Otherwise, those lights looked like they were coming closer. I could swear it. Then I started to feel like I was hearing some kind of voice from where those lights were, but I couldn't be sure. It was very strange. After finishing the smoke break, we got back in the car since it felt way too creepy. Just to kind of put everything at ease, I said, No worries, we're just visiting and we come in peace. I know you're out there. My friend just glared at me like I was a mad woman, knowing that at least one Wendigo and some other beings roamed around this forest. At least that's what the stories say. Well, nothing really eventful happened, until afterwards. I went to bed that following night, and I had a very strange, lucid dream. I could almost say it was astral for what it was worth. In the dream, I was going close to the forest, looking down to where the swamp was. It was a bright afternoon in the middle of winter. The snow was covering almost everything. Then there was a windigo. Now, there's one windigo that always appears in my dreams but this one was different. It looked kind of like a bear's skeleton with a skull, a big skull that looked strange and had antlers and half a skeleton rotten like a corpse for a body. I stared at it and it looked at me and then just started running at me. The sound was deafening. You know that sound you hear after a loud explosion? It was like that, but with white noise and static in my vision. A moment later, I was awake, looking around. I said, what the heck? 
and then turned around and went to sleep again. I fell asleep and I woke up to the same dream. But this time, I was really mad. The next thing I remember was me bolting toward it, bearing some unhuman wrath, ramming my fist into its ribcage and tearing it apart. Moments later, I saw him fall apart, letting out some kind of screech. I later woke up and that was pretty much it. I don't know if the dream is connected to that place and what we saw, but something weird is definitely going on with that forest. My boyfriend and I absolutely adore hiking, and there are many places to go because we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11 p.m. at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We had both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire path, it was actually very clean and stable. We started walking up the trail when we started talking about paranormal things. I know it was probably a terrible move on our side to talk about that sort of thing at night in the middle of the forest, but anyway. Now it is to be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones, and we were both being very observant as to where we were on the path. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we weren't on a trail anymore or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking, but thankfully he said no because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. I truly believe if we had tried to backtrack, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill when thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down, terrified, and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. It was a really strange experience, and I don't really have any explanation. I just know in my gut that it's a really good thing we didn't turn around. This took place in Poland, probably in January. It happened about six months ago. I just had a chat with my friend and I recalled the memory. During winter, I used to go on these short hikes to my local forest. Most of the time, nothing out of the ordinary happened. The most unusual thing was seeing a wolf pack once and that's it. But this event happened at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. The weather was quite cold, about negative 10 degrees Celsius, and snow was lightly falling. There were no people out that day. One hour into the woods, I heard it. This weird music, which seemed to come from all directions at once, and it kept getting louder. It sounded like muffled piano, and something resembling jingles could be heard too. It went on for a solid minute and then slowly faded away. I was so weirded out that I didn't even take my phone out at first, but when I finally did, I realized that my phone had turned off, probably because of the temperature. After the music stopped, I decided to finish my hike anyway, as I found it more in the category of weird than frightening. The other strange thing though is that when I go out hiking, I always see deer, 
wild boars, hares, and other animals. There was not a single living being to be seen after I saw the music. What could it have been? A while back, the night before the last full moon, I went outside past midnight. It was pretty dead quiet outside, especially since it was during a big cold snap. I was out for fresh air when I heard the sound of chains and ice crackling in the near distance. I got a creepy vibe, but I tried to ignore it. There were no cars or people out that I could hear or see. Suddenly, I heard and saw my backyard gate creak open. I felt this intense presence as I heard footsteps quickly approach me. I ran inside and closed the door before it got to me. I couldn't see anything, but I did get a picture in my mind of a being with antlers or horns or something, not clear enough to say for sure but it felt like it was speaking to me telepathically. I could tell that it read heavy energies and it told me don't carry their burdens and that my heart was lighter than I believed to keep it pure and I'd have nothing to worry about. I asked it about how to heal or let go of these pains and frustrations that I'd been having with trying to move on and let go of an ex toxic friend. They told me that they didn't do that kind of work and left. I got the feeling that they did heavier work. It didn't seem to have any harmful intent. There was a wisdom to it, but not something or someone that I would want to cross paths with if I were up to no good. I live in central Canada, if that helps, the prairies. I can't seem to find anything specific online about any deities or entities that match. There's Krampus, but I feel like I highly doubt that that was it. It was way past Christmas, and I don't think it's tied to Canada at all either. The words mentioning my heart being lighter than I believed made me think of Anubis, but I still don't think that it was Anubis either. I'm not really sure what I encountered that night, but it was really fascinating. I am a 23-year-old female, and my husband is a 23-year-old male, and recently we moved in with some roommates. They are James, male 26, Danielle, female 25, and their young daughter Sarah. We went from living in a decent-sized city to living in the middle of nowhere, about an hour away. For context, we live in the south of the U.S., so it's rural, woodsy nowhere. We're really good friends with our roommates, and husband and I knew beforehand that they had both experienced some paranormal goings-on before we made the decision to move in. To be honest, I think husband and I forgot all about the paranormal stuff just before we moved. Everything was great when we were settling. We all got along really well, and it was so amazing to be in a place where we had our own space and were on equal ground with our roomies. Then one night, about a month later, husband, James, and I are all lounging in the living room area. Sarah was asleep in her room, as it was late. We're talking about the paranormal. Around 11.30 p.m., James has to go pick up Danielle from work. She works the late shift, about a half an hour away from us. As James is getting ready to leave, he mentions skinwalkers. Now, husband and I don't use this word. For those of you who don't know, speaking aloud the word skinwalker or wendigo is sometimes believed to attract these deadly creatures to you. Husband and I had strange and horrifying experiences at the last place we lived 
after one of us made the mistake of saying it aloud. So we don't say it anymore. Our code word for it is flush pedestrian, if you're curious. As soon as James said it, I gasped. He laughed it off, but right before he left, he noticed something through the blinds on the back door of the house. He mentioned that he thought there was somebody in the backyard. In truth, we don't really have a backyard. The back of the house is right up against the edge of the woods, but we just call it the backyard. Husband and I, thinking that he's messing with us, laugh it off. Quickly, though, we can see from James's face that he is not. We rush to look through the blinds, and sure as heck, there's something in the trees. It was incredibly hard to see, but it was a very, very tall and thin figure, darting quickly between the trees. It kept itself completely shrouded in the black shadows, and we couldn't make out any other features. James rushes outside, thinking that it's somebody on the property. Husband and I follow, not wanting him to be alone. I stay on the porch while husband rushes down the steps to follow James as he goes behind the house. The second he leaves my eyesight, James immediately turns around and shakes his head at husband. He tells us that as soon as he got to the edge of the trees, he heard a low voice saying, turn around. I come from a pagan background. My mother is Wiccan and my husband is also pagan. As James leaves, the husband and I finish our cigarettes. I immediately set out to bless the entire house with sacred oils and blessed salts. I had already done this as soon as we had unpacked the last of our things, but I felt it necessary to do again. I went so far as to bless the entire porch as well. As husband and I are doing this, James texts me that he doesn't feel safe and that something isn't right. When I ask him what he means, he writes that just a few miles up the road, a naked man came charging out of the woods and stopped at the edge of the road. When he locked eyes with James, he simply pointed at the car and kept doing so until he was no longer visible in the rearview mirror. We tried to rationalize that it could be one of many non-paranormal scenarios. We thought it might be a prank, but that didn't quite make sense. It was the beginning of a very cold winter, and it was only about 20 degrees out. It would have been a lot of effort and discomfort for this man to pull a prank like this on passing drivers. Then we wondered if the man needed help or was possibly in danger. But James was sure that this man did not look at all like he was in distress. If he was, the man would have yelled or tried flagging down the car instead of just pointing at it. The conclusion we came to, for the time being, was that he was most likely on some substances. We don't live in the safest of places, and hard substances are very common around here. Then James texted that he had picked up Danielle, and more weird things were happening. I asked him to elaborate, but he said that he would explain it all when they both got home. As their car pulled up in the driveway, husband and I went outside to meet them but the two of them quickly got out of the car and rushed toward the house, telling us that we all needed to get inside immediately. When inside, James explained that right before he got to Danielle's place of work, he saw something in a cow field that he can't explain. It was tall, taller than any human could possibly be, and much taller than the thing that we had already seen behind the house. From what he could tell in the dark, it was gray and it was running, running faster than he was driving at 60 miles per hour, on all fours. And then it ran into the woods out of sight. When he was driving back with Danielle, before James could explain everything that had already happened, she got a sinking feeling in her gut and made James lock all the car doors. A literal second after James complied, the same creature he had just seen was once again sprinting alongside the car. It was much closer to the road than it had just been minutes before, but it dashed again into the trees before they could get a really good look at it. We were all a bit shaken. It was now close to 1 a.m. and none of us could explain anything that had already happened. 
We tried to brush it all off, and we probably could have, if it was just one thing that had transpired instead of several. We made the awful decision to go back outside for a smoke, the kind of decision that only idiots in horror movies would make, I know. And that's when things got really weird. Off to our right, there's a small strip of woods that separates our property from our landlord's property, where he lives with his daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughters. In those trees, we notice three sets of eyes. They're glowing yellow-green, and they're just staring at us. Husband asks James if it could be deer, as we do tend to see a lot of those around, but we all knew that whatever those eyes belonged to were far taller than deer could be. Then, to our left, there's more, you guessed it, woods. From that direction, in the pitch dark, I swear I heard a little girl laugh. It wasn't boisterous or loud, more like the snicker that a child makes when they're trying to suppress their laughter. Danielle and husband didn't hear it, but James did. Now we're looking at the big tree to our left that stands just before the edge of the woods, and notice that there's this big black mass behind it, as though something was crouched next to the tree. We all try to rationalize that it's just a big bundle of leaves, but I don't think any of us really believed that. James and husband both dart back inside for a moment, and when they come back out, James is holding a hatchet, and husband is holding his crossbow. Without saying anything to Danielle or I, they step off the porch and walk toward our left, where the little girl laughed. Later, they told us that they thought a child was in trouble and they wanted to help. While Danielle and I were on the porch, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, we see something a few yards away. Down the driveway, there's a huge tree in the middle of the property. Out of our peripheral, we swore that we saw something duck from behind the tree. We kept looking at the tree, and yes, there was something poking its head up from behind the trunk, pulling back very quickly as soon as it realized we were staring at it. At this point, Danielle and I wanted to get inside. We're both shivering from fear and cold, and we just wanted this night to be over. But while Danielle and I were in a match of paranormal peekaboo, husband and James had their own very weird experience. For context, I have Tourette's syndrome. This means that I say and do things completely out of my control, and some of my verbal tics are just strange sounds. Some of those sounds include blowing raspberries or popping my lips, which are my two most common verbal tics at the moment. As James and husband are inching closer to the trees, they both hear footsteps through the grass and leaves within the trees. Both of them were too frightened to call out to whoever they thought was in there. Then they hear shuffling. The problem is though, they each hear shuffling coming from different directions that the other doesn't hear. James was walking to the left, husband to the right. James hears shuffling coming from the right, but husband doesn't hear it. But husband hears it coming from the left and James doesn't hear it. So they turn toward each other with their weapons drawn. In their confusion, while they're facing each other, they hear someone running in the woods, full on sprinting through the trees, heading directly toward them. And then it just stops. They take a step back and watch to see if anybody comes out of the woods. No one. But then they hear something in the woods. They hear me in the woods right in front of them. They heard both of my verbal tics, but the problem was I was standing on the porch behind them. Without turning around, husband calls to me and asks if I just had a tick. I told him no. They back away from the woods without taking their eyes off of that spot until they're close enough to sprint into the house, pulling Danielle and I with them. Inside, Danielle and I are able to tell them about the thing behind the tree, and James and husband are able to tell us about how something mimicked my tics to a T. For the rest of the night, we didn't go back outside. 
We would all, against our better judgment, peek through the blinds out the back door when we passed it. There was still something in the woods every single time that one of us looked. I didn't get any sleep. Come morning time, husband and I checked all the places that we had seen or heard something, and there was no sign of anyone or anything. I asked my mother what she thought it might be. In her opinion, it was likely something related to a mimic spirit, a spirit that warps reality to feed on fear, but not having enough power to really hurt anybody. She said that it couldn't be a skinwalker because there were too many things happening in too many different places all at once. Skinwalkers are solitary and territorial things, so it couldn't have been multiple of them. But just one mimic could do all the things we experienced. We still hear the occasional giggle in the dark, get a bang or a knock at our back door. We still even see the thing behind the big tree in the driveway almost every night. But that night was something else. I've seen some things in my life, but never, never have I gone through about three hours of nonstop activity. I've since burned sage all throughout the house and the entire perimeter of the property, as well as using the rest of my salt and oil around the entire house. Husband and I even did a late night EVP session at all of the spots that things had happened that night, but we didn't get a single response to any of our questions. I don't know for sure if it was a mimic spirit, or if I can fully rule out a skinwalker. I don't even really know if the thing was dangerous or not. But one thing's for sure, I will never forget that night. So, I'm a pretty skeptical person when it comes to the paranormal, albeit having a vested interest in the tales and evidence. I'm the kind of person who browses ghost hunter videos on YouTube and stories on Reddit. I've also visited plenty of purportedly haunted locations in the US, including but not limited to places like the Omni Parker House, the Molly Brown House, the Whaley House, Alcatraz at Night, the Winchester House more than once, and none of them have yielded any sort of evidence. A part of me wants to believe but is also terrified at the prospect of witnessing something. I was mostly a non-believer, up until a couple of months ago. In short, I had wanted to plan a surprise party and getaway for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She had mentioned wanting to hit the slopes. It was January, so it was still winter time at this point. I organized this months ahead and had invited some of her closest friends to join. I ended up renting an Airbnb cabin that had enough rooms to house 10 people, or 5 couples. One entire lower floor basement level with 2 beds, a room on the first floor, and 3 rooms upstairs. Also adding that this cabin was in a beautiful rural neighborhood in Tahoe, California, with tons of cabins next door, down the street, adjacent, etc. So there's plenty of housing around us. Nothing peculiar about it and there are other people staying around. Of course, my girlfriend and I take the master bedroom upstairs, and right across the hall is another couple in one room, and my girlfriend's cousin by herself in the third room next door. All rooms are taken, and the middle floor is a lively area with games, a fireplace, and a foosball table. These details are somewhat relevant and important later in the story. The first night was a night of merry drinking and games. To celebrate the occasion, we had decorated the living area and blown up balloons to be loosely strewn about the large and cozy living room and the family room where we imbibed. It was almost uneventful with respect to weird happenings, except toward the end of the night, balloons would randomly pop at odd intervals. Someone in our group suggested that it was the balloons getting attracted toward the heater vents and popping. I was dismissive of this because not all of them that popped were congregated near vents. I just took note. I didn't want to argue or suggest anything weird at this point. After we all retired for the night and all the lights were off, 
we could hear balloons popping downstairs at random intervals that reverberated through the silent house. This happened between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. The next morning, there were still plenty of healthy balloons strewn about. Fast forward to night two. After we return from snow activities, we prep for drinking and the usual. After a full day's worth of shredding the snow, we're all collectively tired a bit earlier than the previous night, and we decide to retire around 11.30 to midnight. Here's where I personally experienced things that got me feeling irked. Since it was cold, I decided to go downstairs to turn on the thermostat or heater. Our couple friends across the hall had their door slightly open ajar. The lights were on and the bathroom was in use. As I'm going downstairs in the dark stairwell, I hear the floorboards behind me creak. I figure it was my friend coming out to follow me for a cup of water or to go to the kitchen. As I walk across the living room and stop at the thermostat, the lights are still off at this point and the creaks continue. And then I hear it stop a few feet behind me near the kitchen. The kitchen lights don't turn on and I hear nothing else. Feeling like he was waiting behind me and I was being watched, I said, what's up dude, need something? I turn around and nobody is there. I've only ever read about this dreadful feeling of being watched, and it is indeed every bit as dreadful upon realization in person. A minute ago, I swore someone followed me down. I was taken aback, and my skeptical self once again took note and spoke nothing of it. I went back upstairs. About 30 minutes pass, and it's still cold. At this point, everyone is asleep and I decide to turn up the thermostat a couple of notches. Nothing crazy. I turn on the upstairs hallway light bright enough to light the steps and see from downstairs. I proceeded to head downstairs and stop once again at the thermostat. No floorboard creaks except for my own this time. As I'm turning up the thermostat and thinking to myself how odd that creaking was the first time, a noise broke my train of thought. I hear the ball from the foosball table, several feet away near the fireplace, audibly roll across its surface and hit one of the side walls. Nobody is around, and I am certainly too far away to touch it. I froze in fear and hastily went back upstairs. Somehow I went back to sleep, not even knowing how to mentally process the increasingly evident occurrences. I eventually fall asleep under the pretense that nothing is definitive enough for me to be conclusively sure that this cabin is haunted. I don't mention or wake anyone up about my experiences. The next morning as we leave and drive back home, the balloons were brought up by my girlfriend's friend and couple who stayed across the hall. I took this as an opening to talk about my experiences and I disclosed them. At this point, my girlfriend's friend goes pale gets really serious and tells us that the previous night she was still wide awake when she noticed a dark figure standing at the foot of her bed. She states that she went into panic mode after blinking and realizing that it wasn't a dream or a hallucination. She shook her boyfriend awake, the guy that I thought had followed me down the stairs earlier that night, only to have it disappear when he woke up. This, by far, coupled with my experiences, is undeniable evidence. I myself was wide-eyed upon hearing this solid piece of information. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the room next to us, then mentions that she heard what sounded like breathing in her room, but dismissed it as naturally occurring sounds of the walls of the cabin. These events standalone could be nominal and may be explained, but collectively, it's really hard to deny that something was present and amiss. I'm hoping that this is the extent of my run-ins with the paranormal, because I don't want to experience anything like this again. The universe has made this skeptic more of a believer.
It all happened during November of 2017. I had just graduated and decided to sign up for the school's annual graduation trip to Johor and Singapore. At the time, my friends and I subscribed to very dumb content on YouTube, such as the 3am challenges. I can't believe I used to think that that was legit. When we arrived at the hotel at 10pm, my friends and I that were assigned to the same room decided to push through the fatigue and stay up until midnight to go explore the floor, or in other words, go ghost hunting. The hotel had already sketched me out when I saw the ancient looking lobby and had witnessed the hotel workers warning us not to use the lifts. We had to climb to the 15th floor. Before the trip, we already knew that this establishment had a dark history of side cover-ups. For example, we heard rumors of an unaliving on the 13th floor that caused a whole entire room to be sealed up. It's midnight, and my other friend and I decided to split up to explore both pathways of the current floor. We wanted to go hang out in the lobby, but unfortunately it was pitch black down there. Unsurprisingly, we saw nothing and proceeded back to our room for bedtime. At 4 a.m., I had a strong urge to pee and I was shivering so badly from the cold. So I got up to relieve myself and right when I finished up, I began to go back to sleep when I hear three clear knocks on the front door. I know this was dumb, but I opened the door without looking through the peephole. I swear that if it was somebody with malicious intent and not some kind of paranormal thing, that would have turned out pretty badly. As expected, I didn't see anybody though, so I just coerced myself back to sleep. I told myself that I was tired and I was probably still half dreaming. Turns out I was wrong. As I turned back, it started again, but this time I did look through the peephole because my common sense started to return. Again, nothing. I retraced my steps back to the bed and I tucked myself in while preparing mentally to just ignore the knocks. Another three knocks happened when I rested my head on the pillow. This time, I chose to not even give it a thought. The opposite happened. The knocks became louder and faster. Then they started to become bangs. It was at that moment that I knew that whatever I'd been hunting had started to play with its food. I tried waking up my friends, but to no avail. They managed to continue sleeping while I was slapping and shaking them while something was trying to get into the room. I finally gained the courage and grabbed a chair nearby. I proceeded to stand guard in front of the door. I would go on to pray while getting tormented by whatever was outside until I finally passed out at around 6 a.m. The next morning, the whole squad was asking if I had sleepwalked. I tried explaining to them what had happened, but nobody believed me. This really irritated me for like half the day until my friends from another room called us over that night to game. That night scarred me for life. This was the night that we potentially saw a real life possessed person. The teachers didn't allow us to travel between rooms to meet our friends, so we had to sneak over there. While sneaking, we saw a woman wearing a pink color baju kurum without the tudung on, on the 13th floor. We saw her when we looked down into the lobby. Her face was obscured by the floor's ceiling. She was ramming her whole body onto a random door and she was levitating. And before we went sneaking, the class group chat had messages regarding students seeing feet floating past the bottom of their room's front doors. Before we realized that she was levitating, we thought it was just some drunk person, but soon started questioning why she would even be drinking alcohol in the first place given the culture. We started recording the situation after about three minutes of whatever that thing was banging the door, but she would burst into a sprint and dashed her way toward the lift lobby on the floor, which is a blind spot. We patiently waited until it decided to reappear. But before that, two Malay women walked past the lift lobby and headed straight to the room that the thing had been banging on. Halfway to the room, the thing in pink starts walking again 
instead of levitating behind them and follows them right into the room. After that, we tried running back to our room, but we realized it was locked from the inside. So we spent the night over in the room we'd snuck over to. I still remember the panic that my parents had when I texted them about it. They told me to delete the footage and kept asking me if I did the room entering ritual correctly. To this day, I'm still tempted to return to that hotel, but my gut is telling me not to. Was it ghosts? Mold? Our imaginations? I guess I'll never know. I'm going to preface this by saying that it isn't my story, but something that happened to my parents. They live in Western New York, upstate, and they're very open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens, for reasons other than this encounter. That's a story for another day though. It might be a good time to add that my parents do not use substances or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition goes. I'm just going to copy and paste the text message that my mom sent me about this experience. I thought somebody would find it interesting, or maybe even have an explanation for them. This is what my mom had to say. Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a UFO, or something, between Randolph and Steenberg. There was a huge, very bright light blinking off and on in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except that it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that's not a falling star. I even thought it might be a plane, but it was too bright and too fast and it was plummeting downward with intention. Then all of a sudden, mid-sky, it was just gone. I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or the trees. Right then I said, did you see that? And at the same time, dad said, what the heck was that? He said that he was thinking the same thing I was. And at the same time, we both noticed out loud there are no mountains. And there weren't. No mountains, no hills, no trees. It was just cornfields and open space. And this thing just blinked out of existence. The next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky. And it shot directly upward, back into the sky. I was looking out of my rear view, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad turned around watching it, and it started to follow us. We had that same eerie feeling that we did when we saw that thing that we thought was Bigfoot. All we kept saying was, what the heck is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. Isn't that weird? from California, and way back when I was on the college search, I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop, so my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old run-down overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees, 
so my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curve. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, Yoo-hoo. I kid you not, when I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the you who, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. My boyfriend and I went to visit family in New York, and we stayed at the Hyatt Grand Central. I believe that there's a paranormal world due to having experiences in my childhood home. I also know that Grand Central Station is known to be haunted. Our hotel was connected to the station, but I didn't think anything of it. Of course, ghosts can't travel from building to building, or so I thought. It was our last night, and I was asleep. I woke up to the sound of the hotel doorknob moving, as if somebody was trying to come in, but I never heard the door open. I closed my eyes and said to myself, you're just imagining things. I heard it again, and I looked up. When you walk into this room, there's this long walkway, and the bed is to the right. 
I looked up and I swear to Jesus and all of his disciples that I saw a man, a tall figure with black eyes, peek around the corner. I screamed, somebody's in here. As soon as I screamed, he disappeared and I heard the doorknob again, as if he had walked out. My boyfriend jumps out of bed, butt naked, and runs around the room. The door was locked, so I don't believe it was an actual person, because hotel doors are heavy, and you can usually hear when somebody opens and closes them. Of course, you can't lock the door behind yourself. I only heard the doorknob move, but never heard the door so we figured it was a spirit. I later found out that there are tunnels from the hotel to the train station, and many people have died in the tunnels. Beautiful hotel, but I will not be returning. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch after those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds and then a loud bang came then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door. It was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth, while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment, I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. 
My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer. Another cliche thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal, except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, the night of the event, there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that, but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us, because I had been living there for about three years, and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus, I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. But why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving, and it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much. The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. Personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on, so why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt along with my mother have had many unexplained experiences and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. 
I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. That feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like, Pics or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2 Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools, but when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably ten screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, 
using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail, near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well-preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. 
I walked another five minutes or so before I started to hear something faint, something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and I'm still at least two miles from civilization, and that civilization in reality was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music, more specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life, no birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place. Unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue. The music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone, the gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another park service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, did you hear the bagpipes along with it? Or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses. And Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, it's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago. 
maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, Your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then it cut off. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general, and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now since I was the only one in the cabin. I decided to lock the door to my room just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first, I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, 
but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams, and I'm in no rush to see it again. I figured I would share my experience living in a 200-year-old cabin that was definitely haunted. So all of these things happened over a span of three years. It started in 2012. A childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. I needed to get out of my parents and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin it dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family that owned the house. They owned a large portion of the land that's now one of the largest cities in the US. Search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a bunch of images that look just like it. We originally think that it was used as slave quarters, as this was tobacco country, and then later found out that it was a stable house later on. The stable house theory definitely checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have it. The night we moved in, I knew the place had something eerie about it. There were no doors to the upstairs room, my room, and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that somebody had added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much-needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout didn't have either. Now that you have a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start the story. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold, and damp, much like a cellar. Par for the course with that type of house, but there was something else. It started with scratching. Every night that I would be in bed, I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was long and drawn out, like a foot long pull, then repeated. I just covered my head, muffled my ears, and closed my eyes. I was a 23-year-old man that felt like I was cowering, but I wasn't about to tussle with wood-scratching spirits. Well, one night, I heard the scratching start. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late, and that's when I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room, and then it went down the wall and then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall, and then gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. Like I said, it was an old log cabin. There were no spaces anywhere for something to crawl, like when you have insulation and stuff like that. I got scared and I started sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was all in the first week, by the way. Here's the creepiest part. When we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut. We had to clean out weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. We had to write, doesn't live here, on the hundreds of mail order catalogs that the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but now I'm not sure if we're too far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with when somebody was with you. 
until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity started to loom over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building up in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprang up from my sleep and I looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off. Just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time it was far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I had turned it off myself. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happened in there. Maybe because it was an addition, I don't know. Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid after being married for five years, so that part worked out, I guess. Anyway, once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window started to open and shut. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny that it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling at it, telling it to leave us alone and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it worked. Kind of, for a while. Then when I was home alone, alarm clocks started going off. As soon as my wife would leave, drawers would open, there would be banging on the front door, and these alarm clocks would go off. Over time, it just stopped, slowed down, and ultimately fizzled into nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Who knows? Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords. And the home is cute, homey, and warm. I spend time there alone, and I don't feel any malice. Weird experience. I would do it all over again if I had to, though. Can't argue with results. I didn't believe in ghosts for the first 22 years of my life, until I spent three months living in a haunted cabin. I always thought that there was some reasonable explanation for hauntings, and honestly sometimes I still do. Maybe this wasn't a ghost, maybe it was some kind of weird gravitational energy messing with things, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My roommate and I, let's call him Derek, moved out to Colorado with meager savings into a small cabin that was pretty much out in the boonies. Our closest neighbors used their cabins as summer homes, so we didn't really have anybody nearby. That's what's cool about living in the mountains, though. There's a sense of total isolation that you won't get anywhere else. You can turn off everything in your living space and hear nothing but the breeze. No highways, no car alarms, nothing. It's very peaceful. But after the first week or two in this cabin, Derek and I begin to notice weird things happening. First, there was this eerie feeling that we would get. I remember Derek once joking with me that he didn't like being in the cabin alone because it gave him creepy vibes. There was one back room in particular where if you stood in it at night, you would feel like you were being watched Sometimes I would come home from work and just have this sense of total dread and unease with no explanation. At the time, I wrote it off as me just being paranoid. You know, hallucinating stuff that isn't there because I wasn't used to the total silence and winter isolation. I started noticing things getting moved around as well. One morning, my car keys would be missing and I'd frantically search, only to find them in a weird spot like on top of our refrigerator. I thought Derek was just messing with me, but he kept insisting that it wasn't him. Soon, he started having his stuff get moved too, and he would get really irritated at me, thinking that I was trying to prank him back, even though he hadn't pranked me in the first place. 
One night we were sitting around playing video games when something flew across our field of vision. We both looked at each other for a second before realizing that we had both seen it. For context, the cabin was a typical A-frame, so for the most part, it was one big room separated into a loft and a downstairs, with the kitchen and our beds at one end and the living room TV wood stove at the other. Whatever small object flew across the room had gone from the kitchen all the way to the front door. We examined it closer and found out that it was a single green bean from our meal that evening. We kind of held it up and looked at it for a second. It had flown all the way across the house, from the stovetop in the back, all the way to our front door. We really didn't have anything to say about it. It was just super weird. The next morning, though, was when I knew our house was haunted. I was watching some TV in the front room when BAM! The roll of paper towels we had sitting on our kitchen counter flew into the table and knocked a glass of water everywhere. The roll had been thrown with force, to the point where I thought Derek had tried to chuck it at me. I turned around to tell him off, but then I realized he wasn't there. He'd been in the shower the whole time, getting ready for work. I felt a chill go down my spine. Some force, spirit, ghost, whatever, had thrown this thing across the room. Derek didn't believe me when I told him, and I couldn't blame him, but he soon came to his senses. The next couple of months were crazy. Everything from car keys to full decks of cards to box cutters would be thrown around our apartment right in front of our eyes. We'd hear weird growling sounds at night that sounded like they were right in the middle of our house. To be fair, sound carries strangely in the mountains, so maybe we were just hearing some nearby animals, but still. One time, my roommate stormed out of the shower, furious. What the heck? He said. Why would you turn the lights out on me in the shower? I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. But by far the most frustrating thing was how our stuff just kept going missing. I mean, it got ridiculous. One night we left our car keys in a very particular spot just to see if they had been moved in the morning. When we woke up, they were gone. But not just that, they had been tucked between the pages of To Kill a Mockingbird on our little bookshelf. It took us hours to find them. Another morning, I could not for the life of me find my phone. We tried calling it, and it would ring, sounding loudly throughout the house, but we couldn't pinpoint the exact spot. Finally, we tracked the ringing to the bathroom, but it sounded like it was coming from behind the wall. The vanity sort of hung there, so I thought, eh, it's probably in the wall seeing how weird everything's been. Maybe there's a hole or something. I took the vanity off its hanging nail and as soon as I moved it, my phone slid out the back and clattered onto the floor. Derek and I looked at each other, and his face was totally pale. How is that even possible? The haunting got to the point of just being silly. We had a friend come visit, and as soon as she opened the door, my car keys were thrown in her face from across the room. She was like, wait, is the cabin haunted? We kind of joked that, yeah, things get thrown around sometimes and you just have to ignore it. She didn't want to stay there anymore. And that was the point where I asked my landlady if she could provide some history on the cabin we were renting. She got really defensive about it and said she had owned it for years and nothing weird had ever happened there. Long story short, we got evicted a couple of months later. I don't really want to go into it because it doesn't have anything to do with the story. But yeah, the uneasiness persisted until we moved out. Although in the last month of living there, the ghost chilled out on throwing objects at us. I still don't have a concrete explanation for all of the weird things that happened. But I definitely believe in ghosts and other things that we don't understand.
I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before, all of it going in through one earbud while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day, and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast, and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. Back in 2004 to 2005, I worked in a group home supporting people experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mostly worked nights, and since the clients in that home were pretty chill, we were always allowed to sleep a few hours before getting our clients up and ready for the day. I usually slept on the couch, with my shoes on the floor next to the couch, and my cell phone, keys, etc., either on the table in my shoe or next to my shoes. One morning I got up and started getting things ready for the day. I had left my phone on the floor in front of the couch. I was a few feet away from the couch, looked over, and I saw a hand reach out from under the couch, grab my cell phone, and start to pull it under the couch. I lunged down and grabbed my phone with one hand. I pulled my phone back toward me but I felt the resistance of whatever had a hold of my phone, pulling it away from me under the couch. After a moment of tug of war, I pulled my phone from the grasp of the hand and it disappeared back under the couch. I was really freaked out, and even to this day I get chills thinking about or relating this experience. The hand was obviously thin to be able to slide in and out from underneath that couch. From the wrist to the tip of the fingers was maybe three to four inches. 
The skin on this hand was gray and wrinkled, almost shriveled, and the nails, the fingernails were long, pointed, thick and yellow. I have no idea what it was that tried to take my phone or why it wanted it, but it creeps me out to this day. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night, 
My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell. There was no blood or viscera. And the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle. And eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. 
The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband who worked the night shift to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So, I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was unfortunately all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill, drink some coffee, hang out and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out, he wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again.
My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear, either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks, in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift to see and experience things that were, I guess, paranormal for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences, and me, being not the bravest person on earth, would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened. Someone would die, or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze, and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members. But nothing. Just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me, but long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out, and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation, but the fact that she died a while after really scared me, and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me. I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but I had never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do there is just to drive around and see the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery we came across, and we found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field, where the stones are not even visible aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet. Another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge. Just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at, and we never experienced anything. We later go to college, and we still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that was known to be haunted but the location was kept a secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out that they have to list the cemetery in county directories. That's how he found it. Anyway, he tells us that he can take us there, so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night, we take it very unseriously, but we still wanted to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. 
Yes, it was stupid and wildly disrespectful, and we were childish. We asked another question and waited. It was dead silent, and then we hear the leaves crunching, step by step, from the darkness toward us. It sounds like somebody stops right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen. And then we heard the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of shock. The whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it because it was so otherworldly. We slowly began walking and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car without a word between us. I still wonder if what we heard was a big cat or something, but where I live, those are pretty much unheard of. I have never heard anything like that scream to this day. We all still remember it, so I know I didn't make it up, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. This story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, and candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town and randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he had heard a rumor of some weird lights out in an old cemetery just outside of town. Tiege was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started to back up what Tiege was saying, so I told them that as soon as I had finished up cleaning the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at around 1am. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck, so the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods, and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old, and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck, so I parked the truck right in front of it. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out, at this point, I didn't really trust Tiege, and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at 2 o'clock in the morning, so I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes pass, and we're starting to see these fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could even see them in the woods around us. I asked Tiege if those were the lights he saw. But before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill, and that's when I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us, and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been from them moving around in the woods where trees were blocking the light. I started freaking out, and I was screaming at both of them, and I told them that if they were playing some kind of elaborate prank on me, it wasn't funny and that I was leaving. I tried to start the truck, but it turned once and then died. Tiege had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas while turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. 
I looked up and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew I needed to get us out of there. Tej was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted this thing to get closer, but I wasn't hearing it. I was shaking and I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we came. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tej and Justin off their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer searching to see if I could find any explanation for what I had seen. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? No idea. It all seemed like BS to me, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her out there, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge, walked up the hill, and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on tombstones, flashlights, footprints, anything, but we didn't see a thing that could explain what I saw the night before. The cemetery was way too far away from any major road for it to have been car lights. I still don't know what we saw that night, and I get goosebumps every time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens. This is not necessarily super creepy, but creepy enough in a sense that it gave me some peace. And I think maybe my grandma some peace too. It was around Christmas time. I was staying with my then boyfriend and I was staying over at his house, sleeping down in the basement. That night, I had a really strange dream. I was in a house and there was a party going on. When I was there, an older man approached me. He knew my name, and I felt like I knew him. But I also knew that I had never met him in person, and I couldn't place him. He was really sweet, very nice, and we just kind of stared at each other. It was like we were having a conversation, but we weren't. It was kind of strange. I felt so comfortable with him as a person does with a close family member. Finally, he said, Hey, tell your Nana I say hi, and I love her. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. And then I woke up. I told my grandma about it the next day, and gave her some information on what the guy looked like. She started crying on the phone, saying, You just saw my dad. I guess he had died a few years before I was born and I'm actually named after him partially. My middle name is Joe. Turns out his birthday was on December 31st. I believe he would have been 90 something, and the dream that I had was also on December 31st. I just had a strange dream the other night, and I can't quite make heads or tails of it. Quick background that pertains to the dream. My dad passed when I was 13 years old, and when I was really struggling with the loss back then, he appeared to me in a dream, keeping this looming darkness at bay and telling me that I would be alright. I later told somebody about that dream, and they told me that sometimes, when a loved one dies, they can come to you in dreams. I didn't believe or disbelieve really, but it felt like a bit of comfort at the time. Now throughout the years I have had a dream here or there about my dad, and I always found a little comfort in thinking, hmm, maybe it's him. Fast forward about 16 years to my dream last night. 
So in the dream, I was in this boggy, swampy looking area. It was dark, but still lit enough that I could see a road. I was on the road and I knew my destination was the grave of an ancestor, maybe like a great grandfather. And all of a sudden my dad shows up in a suburban. I hop in and we're talking when he almost drives it into a soft shoulder or ditch, which my dad wouldn't do while driving because he drove professionally in his life. We continued down the road and we got to this graveyard where I start asking him questions that he can't answer or is answering wrong. Stuff that he would know. I just got this bad feeling. I just looked at him and said, you're not my dad. He didn't get upset, but he insisted that he was and almost seemed amused. I kept looking for a grave and insisting that he wasn't my father. All the while he kept laughing and saying, of course I am. This horse appears and starts bucking and rearing and really causing a stir until finally my dad went away. The next thing I know, I'm talking to a woman in a place that was just nothing. Like a place that was just void of everything but her and me. She said something like, when you let your dad in as a kid, you broke open a grate. And in my dream, I had envisioned like a giant sewer grate. She said it allowed all manner of spirits to come and visit as they pleased and to masquerade as my dad. She didn't seem at all concerned or like it was a bad thing, just like she was telling me something that was a fact. At that point, I woke up. The details are obviously a little fuzzy, but I can't stop thinking about it this morning. I just figured I'd see what anyone else had to say. Maybe it was just a weird dream, but it certainly felt like something else. This happened to me when I was a toddler, from around one to three years old. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor, while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then, their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, Hey! at the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma had been moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors that I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure that they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing at all to do with those nightmares. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this. For all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience. If my mom hadn't seen the same thing I did. 
She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall shadowy figure at the end of the hall in front of my bedroom. At first she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her, but the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later and my dad backs up the claim since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying that there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of that apartment, and I have never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on, because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. I feel like I should start this story with a content warning first side. About three days ago, I had a pretty weird dream. I dreamt that the mother of my mom's friend committed suicide. I don't remember how, I just remember getting the news from her grandson in the dream. Never met the woman in my life. I only heard about her a few times about a month or two ago. Skip to today. My mom receives a call from the friend, and my stomach just drops. It's like I know that something's wrong. And it is. The woman had hung herself about a half an hour prior. What the heck just happened? Was it all a creepy coincidence? I don't have any emotional connection with that woman at all, nor had I been thinking about her before the dream occurred. My grandmother also had some dream predictions before, but no major events, just some random things. It's really unsettling to me, and I have no idea how to explain it. For the first time in my life, I had a really lucid dream. At least I hope that's what it was. I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, my time, PST. At my back door, it's a security door, so like a metal screen door, I saw something and I thought it was my wife. I asked her why she was out there and she said that she had accidentally locked herself out. I had been out there not five minutes before, and I knew that I didn't lock the door. She was wearing her normal bedtime apparel, but her hair wasn't the right color, and her voice wasn't quite right. I asked again what she was doing, and she just says, just let me in. I get closer to the door, but I can't see her face. I say again, why are you out there? She ignores me again and says, just let me in. I moved to open the door and I noticed that she changed to an inhumanly small frame, which was all black and had no features. I slammed the wood door and bolted to find my wife asleep in the bed where I had left her. Now, if I'm honest, I don't even believe I was dreaming, but my mind cannot comprehend that as being real. Nothing anywhere near that level of paranormal has ever happened to me before. And whether or not it was a dream, it was definitely freaky. And I'm still trying to figure it out. For almost 10 years, a few other people in my family and I 
have had very extreme paranormal experiences. Most of it is too long to get into now. A lot of it is tied to a house that's demonically possessed and possibly a deceased family member who was quite emotionally disturbed and dabbled way too much in the wrong parts of the occult. But last night, I had a very intense dream. In it, this feminine demonic creature thing was over my grandfather in his sleep. I went to go fight it and it screamed at me like a banshee. I backed away for a second, right before I woke up. Like I said, this thing felt very feminine, but to describe how it looked is a little bit difficult. It looked almost as though a large, roughly human-sized sheet of leather became sentient and started floating and moving and flying. It didn't have a solid, discernible form exactly either. It literally almost looked like a flying leather monster. It was so black roughly around where its head might have been, that it was more black than black itself, if that makes any sense. But besides that, like I said, it just sort of looked like a flying leather monster. And then of course there was the horrible threatening scream. I've had other encounters in my sleep with evil paranormal entities at this point, and it's pretty much all connected to that certain house, and possibly that family member but I'm just wondering what it was. Was it actually a banshee? There's also this wolf that has been stalking around the house for a few months now. It attacked our dog, actually. The house is in Connecticut, but it's in the north, where it's very condensed forest. So it's extremely uncommon, but not unfathomable, that a rogue wolf ended up there. I personally saw a mountain lion there once. And I've seen my fair share of black bears, but I don't know what this thing could have been. I haven't actually lived in the house in question for about four years. Other family still does though. I don't know what's going on and I've never seen an entity like that thing before. I'm just trying to figure out if anybody might know what it is. About three years ago, my friend who I had known since birth was diagnosed with leukemia. After an intense and scary year-long battle, the cancer won. I miss him so much that I'm tearing up just writing this. Something happened before he died though that was really weird. I was eating some food in my dream and my friend rang the doorbell. He had all of his hair and he looked happy and healthy. He looked at me and said, I had a life I was going to live and I couldn't live it. I want you to live a life and enjoy it. He smiled a bit and shrugged and said, Hey, it'll be okay without me. I'll miss you too up there, but don't worry about me. The pain is gone. He went in for a hug and we hugged for what felt like an eternity. I love you, man. He said as his parents car door opened i yelled mark don't leave me live you have to live he just looked at me and said sorry man i gotta go and kind of laughed i screamed and screamed don't leave me over and over but he got in the car drove down the street into a bright blue light his favorite color the second that the car was engulfed, I woke up crying and screaming. This all happened just as my mom got home. She walked in as I was crying and she said, Mark died. And I just kept crying and said, I know, I know. I cried for the whole day, but it did feel better being able to say goodbye in some way. I really do miss him. Rest in peace, Mark.
My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service, besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21-year-old female in my second year of nursing, and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two-bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park, and at night, when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime, but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs, and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 p.m. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends, check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods, until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter because it was light enough to see the sky and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine, until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. 
the sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground, heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double checking the doors and windows when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step, 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on or what this thing is and can tell me what I can do, let me know. Cause I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. I was just thinking of an experience I had one weekend this past summer. I've had many extremely dark paranormal experiences, but this wasn't one of them. It was still emotionally intense and profound in its own way though. I was at an outdoor music festival in Virginia in the United States. It was on an old farm. The property was huge with big rolling fields and a few various small buildings littered about. After that evening's show got called off due to threatening electrical storms and crazy strong wind, I started walking across a field toward a little old shack set back among a few trees. The setting was surreal, like out of a movie. The sky was swirling and churning with dark gray-black clouds. The wind was strong, but felt very refreshing after a hot, sunny, sweaty day. The electricity in the air was palpable. Everything felt slightly charged. As I started walking into the middle of the field, suddenly everybody was gone. I couldn't see or hear a single person from the festival. I kept walking across the field to the shack and I was feeling very heavy emotionally. There was a definite presence, not malevolent, but heavy. When I got to the shack, I collapsed on my knees and I began weeping and apologizing repeatedly. This went on probably for a few minutes, but it felt like it was happening outside of time. It felt to me at this point, like I was addressing formerly enslaved people who had lived and worked on the property. It was like they were all around me. Eventually I stood up. I felt pleasantly exhausted after a big emotional release. I still hadn't seen or heard anyone from the festival since I had first walked away from them. I began walking back slowly toward the field where my car was and the rain started pouring down. I soaked it all in as I walked back to my car. That night, after it became clear that the storm was going to prevent any further music from happening, I drove back to my motel room in heavy rain. I was awake in bed at 3 a.m. or so, when I heard a creaking noise that turned out to be the mini fridge door slowly opening. I got up to check it out. I thought maybe the magnet on the mini fridge was weak, but it wasn't. It was very strong. There was no way this thing opened on its own. So I knew that something was there with me. 
I wasn't quite confident yet in my ability to assess the situation accurately on the spot. So I was feeling a bit leery and self-protective. But as some time went by, I grew more relaxed and I sensed that the spirit was not malevolent. I sensed that she was a female spirit of a formerly enslaved person who had followed me back to my motel room. The energy in the room wasn't dark or ominous. It was like a mixture of sorrow, exhaustion, curiosity, and relief. I looked up the history of the property that the festival was being held at, and I confirmed that the property had been home to many enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. I found myself wishing that I had been more comforting and explicitly accepting of her during those first few hours. I hope she was able to pass on after our encounter. In a way, I feel like she followed me back from the farm before she chose to pass on, because I was a curiosity to her, or maybe because I had shown kindness. Something that makes this experience stand out to me is that I rarely encounter human spirits like this. Mostly, I only encounter human spirits remotely through other people. My immediate radius is always so full of other non-human entities that I think most human spirits just steer clear. But there are a few things about the way this encounter unfolded that I think allowed for it to happen as it did. I had driven 12 hours to get there on the previous day, so there wasn't the usual residual dark energy just hanging around from the get-go. I also feel like the intense swirling electrical wind and rainstorms that surrounded the festival for multiple days created a unique situation energetically. Either way, it was an emotional experience, and it felt cleansing. I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man. So I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time. My father and I found him in his rocking chair with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things, doors opening that shouldn't be, unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots, like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold, 
I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different, almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night, stupid, I know, and I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though, not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks really, but nothing happened. In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better. And they were, for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. My family owns a large piece of land in Missouri. It's near the highlands, but partially on the plains. It includes a lovely little chapel, a one-room schoolhouse, stables, and the plantation home. My family has owned the land for years. I grew up spending school breaks there. It was always enjoyable, regardless of the hard work I had to put in. Every Halloween, my family would do a local hayride and barbecue. It was great fun and everyone loved it. We decorated the entire property. The schoolhouse had all the original desks and materials left in it. So we tried to utilize it the most and the plantation home secondly. It wasn't super structurally sound, so we kept everybody on the first floor. Only family was allowed on the upper floors. Us cousins loved to set up and clean for the big night. The stables were a working area, so we left that to the adults. Nobody went inside the chapel because we wanted to make sure that it stayed in its original good condition. So we'd put up a fake little graveyard and that was about it. The school was abandoned and the house was a walkthrough. When I was 16, I was helping set up the walkthrough. It was cheesy, but fun. I was cleaning the ornate mirrors on the first floor when I heard laughter above me. Figuring it was my cousins, I kept working. I would hear the footsteps of them moving and their laughter for a while. When I got done, I called up that I was going to go help outside and I heard, all right, see you later, and more laughter. I walked out smiling because I found it cute that they were so immersed in the home. 
Imagine my confusion then, when I walked into all four cousins at the main house. I asked them how they had beaten me back, and they looked at me like I'd finally lost it. They told me that they'd been working on the chapel graveyard, and they'd been nowhere near the walkthrough. I told them it wasn't nice to try to trick me. We left it at that and continued on for the day. I only realized we weren't alone when I got a call from my youngest cousin, asking why I was running around upstairs in the plantation home. I got deathly quiet. When she asked me again, I could only say, I'm not even on the property. I'm in town. To this day, we've never figured out who exactly lives upstairs. They don't cause harm, but they do enjoy their mischief. Anymore, we keep in constant contact when we're visiting. Just to be sure we know who we're dealing with. Or what. When I was about 10 years old, I went with my dad to his farm. I spent my vacations there as a child. I don't have a very good memory of my childhood. I hated school. Everything was so bad that I think I erased almost everything from my mind. But that day is like a video of 24 hours that I have never been able to erase. I got there at night, and as soon as we got there, my mom called. I knew it was because I got some bad grades and almost failed at school. My dad was talking to her, and then he told me to go close the main door. As soon as I got there, I saw a humanoid figure, totally translucent. Only its borders were visible. And behind it, six floating light balls, alternating between blue and red. It was very tall but its proportions were not distorted. It was exactly humanoid, but I could see everything straight through it. The dogs at the farm were surrounding it and barking at it, making angry noises. I was a very scared child, but that thing didn't scare me right away. I got curious instead, so I asked, who are you? And it took a step forward. I immediately started crying and ran back inside, calling my dad, saying there was someone in there. He turned off the phone and without hesitation, went to a wardrobe and took a shotgun hidden between some clothes. When we got outside, it had vanished, but the dogs were still barking and surrounding a certain place in the front of the house, farther away this time, but there was nothing there. It's a plain space with our house in the middle of it. There's nothing surrounding us. After 30 seconds or so, the dog stopped and came back inside like nothing had happened. My dad said that I had just seen an optical illusion of the lights from the bus that brought students that arrived around that time. I don't think so. I still have no clue what that was, and I've never had anything similar happen after that. But I remember that day perfectly and it's going to be about 10 years from the day now, next month. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not, is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods, and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, 
there are five or six green fields. Basically, a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield 1, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before, and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or he had gotten lost, but he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot, but the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long. But he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again though, and I don't plan on ever going back. In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked, 
I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, the only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door, and I saw my dog as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house, and would sometimes bark at nothing at all. But the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of suicidal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone and simply using a nightlight to sleep. The last time I lived in that house full time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there 
whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake, three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house. So I don't really know what to think. Am I crazy? Or is that presence back from the past to haunt me? wondering if anybody has any information about the Omni Bedford Springs in Pennsylvania. I live very close and I used to go there daily to swim. It flooded when I was a child. In the early 2000s, Omni bought it and restored it while adding on as well. Construction workers reported many strange occurrences. It was James Buchanan's summer White House. It was a facility to hold foreign diplomats during the wars. The springs are known to have healing properties. I have always felt a presence in the old section of the main hotel. I swam laps there for years in the famous pool. One day, they were filling the pool and the hose was still. They fill it using the natural spring water from the mountain. About 15 minutes later, it looked as if a child was holding it and playing with it swinging it around. My friend and I always swam together and we both saw it. And then we both saw it suddenly stop. On other occasions, we would hear splashing when nobody was in the pool. One time I felt a huge movement in the water while swimming. Nobody was there though. We were the only ones there and my friend wasn't in the pool. We also spotted a gentleman at the top of the stairs to the balcony, where the band used to play for the pool, but nobody was there when we looked again. I have also sat in the library many times reading while waiting on my friend to arrive, or before I hit the road. I would hear sounds. I'm not sure what the room used to be, but the windows are scratched from brides testing their diamonds, I was told. They also have some of the guest ledgers there. All of the things that happened to me were between three in the morning and six in the morning. Does anybody have any idea what's going on there?
For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. It was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything, and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill but all the windows were closed, and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway, at my ex's house, and also an apartment I lived in. I've also seen figures. It was early morning, I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it. And he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room. A black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing and would sometimes see black figures or a man with a mustache in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. 
so I reached forward to pet him, and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side. The shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on, and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere, but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner, and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed, and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars, and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now, I'm just wondering what comes next. I'm a skeptic, but I used to be obsessed with anything paranormal. I lost interest as I got older. I used to believe anything that I would see on those weird History Channel shows about Bigfoot and UFOs. It's not like I think that any of this is impossible, it's just that I'm much harder to convince now. I try to take any footage or pictures of this stuff as rationally as I can. Usually, the simplest explanation is the explanation. Ironically though, I saw something that no matter how hard I try, I cannot explain. Years ago, I was at a party at a house surrounded by woods, miles and miles of isolated Pennsylvania mountains. I got bored and I asked my cousin if he wanted to go for a walk. As we left the property, we had to go down a pretty deep slope that was crowded by rusted out cars, which had been there for over a decade. We found a clearing with a shack that looked like somebody was in the process of demolishing it. And after looking inside, we went back to the party to grab my younger brother. This was back when I was still pretty invested in the paranormal. So before we walked into the clearing again, I got the camera ready on my phone, just in case. The sun was starting to set and as we left the tree line, I saw it. Something streaked out in front of me. It was a line of small bluish orbs, and honestly the best way I can describe it is like the fairies in Ocarina of Time, except they moved so much faster. They were only there for a second, fading in and then fading out, almost faster than I could react. I managed to take a picture, but I thought there's no way I managed to get that. With the sun going down, we had to investigate the shack quickly. I took a few more pictures of the inside and hurried out of there. When we got back, I looked through the photos, and to my absolute shock, I did manage to get whatever the heck that was. The photo came out strange, though. The photo was more like an elongated blob of bright yellow and white, not what I had seen. Surprisingly, nobody seemed to believe me other than a couple of close friends who were into weird things too. Everybody told me that I was mistaken, and one friend even accused me of fabricating it. The worst one was my dad. This dude will believe any fringe idea or conspiracy theory. For example, he once got a ghost detecting app and was absolutely convinced that his dead cousin was trying to contact him from beyond the grave through a free iPhone app. Of course, he thought I was lying about this, though. I tried to come up with some kind of explanation for what I saw, but I couldn't. I'm not going to say it was a ghost or a spirit, because I would have no way of proving that. 
electromagnetic fields can make people see things like that. But that doesn't explain the fact that I had a picture of it, even if it was different. I'm not convinced that it was any weather phenomenon either, since it was a bright, sunny summer day. And fireflies don't look like amorphous blobs of light on camera. Really, all I know is what it wasn't. I guess in true story fashion, those pictures are stuck on a phone and a laptop that no longer work. I am planning on trying to retrieve them at some point. I don't believe the picture had anything to do with the computer or the phone breaking, of course. I've heard people say stuff about ghost pictures causing electronics to stop working. But both of those devices were pretty old, and they didn't stop working until years after I took those pictures. Whether or not you believe me is fine, but I hope you enjoyed the story anyway. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend believing him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it. As it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color, and a worn-out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than forty. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. But I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us. But whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted and it looks like it fits the part. It's old, and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. 
a worker there had to let us in. And he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work, because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, last night I fell asleep at about one, while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. He greeted her, and all she said was, the door is closing now, and continued walking. So, I should start this by saying, I'm a healthy, sane, 18-year-old male. I've never had hallucinations or been seriously sick in my life. I've also never been known to black out or take micro naps. My mother has schizophrenia, but as far as I know, it was pretty mild, and I've never had any symptoms of it. With all of that out of the way, here's what happened. I was hanging out with my significant other before they went to class at college and before I had to go to work. We parted ways and I got on the bus to go home and get ready. I got on the bus with five other people and I sat in the back as I usually do. So all five were in front of me. I looked down to check my phone when the bus started to move so I could check the route because I'm a nervous person and I wanted to make sure that I was on the right route. I was. I looked up after maybe 30 seconds, and I'm absolutely positive that the bus had not stopped to let anyone off. Somehow though, all five of the people that I had gotten on with were just gone. The only people on the bus were me and the driver. It freaked me out a good bit because the next bus stop was still up ahead, so there's no way the bus had stopped and let people out in the middle of the road. I checked my phone again to get my mind off of it, and then suddenly the bus turned onto a different street, which is weird since the route had no turns. It was a straight line. I'm very much into horror, so my immediate thought was, great, I guess I'm going to hell. I signaled that I wanted to get off though, and the driver let me off without saying anything. I've been thinking about this all day, and I still have no idea what could have happened there. I know it's not as creepy as some stories, but it genuinely freaked me out. I wasn't sure where to tell this story, and I probably sound crazy, but this definitely happened. A while ago, I was on the bus back home with my little girl. We had just had a really fun day out. I felt this strong energy, and I wanted to investigate, but with my awkwardness, I just kept my head down, although I kept thinking. What is it about that group of older women that was in the front? And why does it feel like this energy is coming from that direction? This was not just somebody giving off vibes. The feeling was so intense. I'm usually good at reading people, but this just hit different. It wasn't bad either. It felt warm, inviting, familiar and so intense that it made the air around me feel tight, but not in a suffocating way, like a hug from your grandma. I decided to properly look, and this woman caught my attention straight away. Not long after, it was her stop, and I never saw her again. A week ago, on the way home again, I feel this energy again. 
I look up and lo and behold, it's the same woman. At this point, the energy was so intense that I nearly got teary-eyed. She started to smile at me when I started feeling that way, but not in a creepy way, just kind of happy. She was sat on the folding down chairs at the front and kept looking down the aisle. I knew she was noticing me, but not making direct eye contact. It felt like she knew that I knew. I know this may sound ridiculous, and it was just based off of a feeling, but it's a feeling I haven't been able to shake. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, if anything. But it was interesting, and I wanted to share. For some background, whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty much alone on bus rides. I was always on one of those small buses. We didn't have any other kids on there, but the highest amount of kids on the bus was probably around five, including me. I was the only one from my school on that bus. All of the other kids went to the same school, and it wasn't mine. Plus, I've had about four different bus drivers in my time. The one I'm going to talk about lost her husband about a year before, and she was out for a long time. She had just gotten back when this took place. This happened about four or five years ago, and I was still pretty young. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids, and we were heading to my school. We were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused. I thought maybe the bus had broken down, but being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything. I just waited. Then the bus driver opened the door. I started to feel a bit uneasy. We weren't at my school yet, and there was nobody there, so why was she opening it? She stared out the door for like two minutes when I finally said, are you okay? I asked, without looking away from the door, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills, there's a man there. There was no man there, no person at all. She kept staring for a couple of seconds when she finally closed the door and continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year and I do miss her. She was a very sweet lady but that moment still freaks me out. I sometimes think that maybe the man she saw was her husband. I don't know who else she would open a school bus door to. I don't know why she would stop the bus in the first place, especially for a stranger. Maybe she saw her husband and it wasn't until after the door was open that she realized he was dead and that's why she stared. I don't really know what happened that day, but I'll never forget it. I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents. Accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus, a young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong and she said that there was nobody back there 
and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. There was no shadow, no sound, no buddy. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky. I'm a bus driver for TransLink, bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex with most of its buildings run down and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night Always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight, and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So I just closed the door and gunned it. I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, what the, and I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure-sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open. I asked the couple what the problem was, but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. When I was a kid, I was sitting in the back seat of my parents' car, traveling through a built-up area, when my brother, who was sitting next to me, suddenly cried out in fear. My mom was in the front passenger seat and quickly turned around to ask what the matter was. My brother said, I've just seen a woman standing in a bus shelter and she didn't have a face. He then went on to explain that where her face should have been there was just a gaping hole, but it was glowing white. The bus shelter had been on my side of the road, but I had been looking out the front, so I never saw anything. I asked my mom if we could go back and see if the woman was still there, but my brother was genuinely scared and begged us not to. At the time, my mom said that she thought it was just her car's headlights flashing in the woman's face. But the way my brother was so scared definitely made me question that explanation. I'm a 
middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. But I've driven this part a million times and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus barn gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work, and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. My cat and I were on the bus heading up to a takeaway so I could get food for us. The nice lady sells tuna to me for my cat. And I saw multiple figures get onto the bus out of the corner of my eye. My cat even meowed at them. But when I stood up, there was no one around other than the driver. I asked the driver if anybody else had gotten on. 
and he just kind of shook his head and gave me this worried look. I think he had seen what I had seen, but didn't want to address it. On my walk home that night from the chippy, I saw numerous shadows in the fog, which startled my cat so much that he actually jumped off my shoulder, and I later found him at home. Usually, my cat is really well behaved, so I have no idea, but that night and that night bus were freaky. A few years back, my mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousin's, and their kid's house. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, Although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, she suddenly saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three young people. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all as the shops are regular meeting places for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd about these young people. My mom said that they were dressed in the period of the 1970s, when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but nobody was acknowledging them. Their existence was completely overlooked by other people, as if they were invisible. My mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious teenagers had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought maybe they had gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes later, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was how normal these teenagers looked, but the fact that she was the only one that seemed to be able to see them. It's a story she still tells today. I had moved into a new apartment with a roommate who was related to a friend of mine. This apartment was located on the opposite side of town, and I was not familiar with this area when I moved there. A lot of these apartments were literally newly built, but a lot of the lots around the area were still being developed, and it was a very desolate part of town. Most of the area, before construction began, was large amounts of old farm areas that were unkempt and no longer lived on. I am very sensitive to the paranormal, and during this time I was just beginning to understand why there was so much paranormal energy around me. My fear was literally a beacon, as my aunt explained to me. The very first event I experienced after moving into my new apartment happened within a week. At the time, I didn't have my own car, and besides getting rides from friends, I mostly had to take the bus to get to work. The bus stop that I had to walk to was pretty far away from the apartment complex. There was a lot of new construction everywhere on that road in front of the complex, but there was a gas station and a very small shopping plaza that was mostly empty, except for a bank and a small mom and pop grocery store. I used to sometimes stop at this grocery store and get some Starbucks iced coffee before walking to the bus stop. One very early morning, I want to say maybe around 5.30 a.m. I was walking to the bus stop. I had my earbuds in and I was just walking along, not really paying attention to my surroundings. Suddenly I got a very cold chill 
up and down my spine, and I got the distinct feeling that someone was walking behind me. I turned around, but nobody was there. I got a little nervous and left one of my earbuds out just to keep myself a little more alert. I continued walking and was almost to the shopping plaza when I heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around again, and even though I continued hearing the footsteps and was totally frozen in fear, I didn't see anything. I couldn't move a muscle. And then I heard something rustle in the bushes next to the sidewalk very close to me, and the footsteps stopped. I caught my breath, and for some reason the energy that I felt was not a positive one. So I decided to sprint to the little grocery store in the plaza. I calmed myself down long enough to walk over and buy what I needed. Then I realized I had at least another seven to eight minutes to walk to get to the bus stop. As I near the door to leave the store, in the parking lot, I see as clear as day a figure of a man that seemed like he was standing in his own fog. I honestly couldn't tell any of his features, but as soon as he seemed to realize that I saw him, he vanished before my eyes. I looked around to see if maybe anybody else had seen it, but it was 5.50 a.m. at this point, and no one was in the store with me except for the person at the register. I gathered my courage and forced myself to walk to the bus stop. As I'm waiting for the bus to arrive, I again started to feel a shiver, and my heartbeat quickened. I got up from the bench where I was waiting and began to look around, but I couldn't see anything. Then, I swear as I breathe, I heard directly in my ear the voice of a man say, I'm sorry. As I'm typing this story out, I literally have chills just remembering the sound of his voice. I instantly knew that it was the figure I had seen in the parking lot. I stood there so freaked out, almost in tears, and the bus finally came to get me. After this happened to me, I paid my friend to drive me to work for the next two months. A lot of other weird things have happened, but this tops the list.